Welcome to Blockchain Explain, the podcast about opportunities, challenges, and trends in blockchain technology. Whether you're a beginner or an expert, a developer, or just crypto curious, this podcast is for you. It features industry leaders and government officials discussing the world of distributed ledgers, cryptocurrencies, and the metaverse. And now, here are your hosts, Alan Rick Schaffen and Kelly Wicker. Hello, and welcome again to Blockchain Explained. I'm Alan Rekshaffen, Chair of the Digital Assets Forum and Lab at the Wilson Center. And of course, with me, as always, is my partner, my co-host, Kelly Wicker, who chairs the uh, science effort at the Wilson Center. Kelly, I, I'm introducing you because we have a, a, a fantastic guest today. So, Kelly, I'm turning it over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Welcome back to another episode of Blockchain Explained. Uh, this is our podcast where we're working to educate a wider audience about the opportunities and challenges presented by blockchain, unpack use cases, and review the regulatory landscape as it develops. Today, we're really honored to have Senator Cynthia Lummis join us to provide insight on how Congress is thinking about blockchain and cryptocurrency, and her view on the action that policymakers should take. Senator Lummis is the first woman to serve as a U.S. Senator from Wyoming, but more pertinent to us here, she was the Senate's first crypto owner, actually. Um, she's been championing uh, cryptocurrency and decentralized finance on the Hill, and we're very excited to hear more from her today. Alan, I'll pass it back to you to frame our discussion, but first, Senator, welcome. Senator, I, I, the, the question I had asked was, um, I know that you were an early adopter of cryptocurrency, and you certainly understand, and I've had the privilege of working with your staff on a, a number of things and, and helped with education. Um, one thing that becomes apparent from some of the things we're doing at the Wilson Center, the Digital Asset Forum and Lab, is that some of your colleagues don't fully um, have the, 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 the holistic picture of how exciting this technology is, of what the potential is. And in the midst of all the financial excitement that we're going through in the country right now, there's some answers that might be there in cryptocurrency and blockchain. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your colleagues and how they are thinking about cryptocurrency and blockchain and what your interaction is with them in understanding the potential as well as the pitfalls. Well, it's been challenging here in the Senate to uh, not only call attention to the importance of regulating digital assets, but to help members understand digital assets. Uh, and among the challenges that we thought we had adequately addressed um, were the differences between, for example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a lot of the alternative coins. Uh, but then when FTX rolled around, we found that people were conflating all digital assets and all pr uh, providers of digital asset services and condemning all of them. Uh, so we took two steps back and have had to start over educating people. There's a big difference between companies that deal in digital asset services, such as lending or custody, and the coins themselves. And of course, there's also a difference among cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin uh, is like digital gold. It is a store of value. Uh, Ethereum, on the other hand, is a blockchain that may never develop into a currency-like asset, but rather become a platform for smart contracts. And most other digital assets, cryptocurrencies, are fraudulent and they're going to go away. Uh, so trying to explain that to members of Congress uh, has been a challenge, and we're regrouping and trying to explain that uh, more every week. And, and you know, it's one of the things that we've been doing with the Digital Asset Forum and Lab um, at the Wilson Center is we've engaged in education efforts through the Science and Technology Program, through our, through our Science and Technology Labs. Um, what, what has been done on the Hill in terms of education um, internally among, among your colleagues? You said that you, know, you have to educate them. What, is there an effort that, that your office is, is taking a charge in and doing that? There is. Um, even a couple years ago, um, I created with uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema uh, the uh, Digital Asset uh, Caucus, which has uh, bi-monthly education uh, gatherings for uh, the key staffers 
that are advising senators on this subject. We bring in speakers. We provide um, books uh, and other reading materials. We um, keep in touch with them regularly so they can take a deeper dive into this subject so they can advise their members. Senator, I know um, last summer you co-sponsored a really important bill that would have, uh, that would seek to create guardrails on this technology that both protects American consumers but also allows the blockchain technology to flourish and for us to find the path forward on that. Could you talk a little bit about um, what that bill entailed? Yes, Senator Gillibrand and I um, co-sponsored that piece of legislation, the Responsible Financial Innovation Act. Uh, we will be uh, reintroducing it in this Congress uh, sometime in April, around the middle of the month, so about a month from now. Um, it um, uses the existing regulatory structure and framework that we have for non-digital assets and just lays uh, digital assets on top of it. For example, commodities um, are uh, under the province of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, Bitcoin is clearly a commodity, uh, so it would fall under uh, the CFTC. Uh, a lot of other digital assets are securities. Um, and they would fall under the Securities Exchange Commission. So we're using that traditional framework, using the traditional uh, Howey test that differentiates what is a commodity from what is a security, um, and putting that in law as well. So the definitions are important, uh, and the framework for conducting regulations important. We need more disclosure and more consumer protection for securities. Uh, and so since most of these digital assets, the alternative coins, the altcoins, will fall under the SEC, uh, they will also need some additional staff to uh, make sure that adequate financial disclosures and consumer protection is occurring, and the SEC is good at those disclosures, uh, so they already have the existing framework uh, to integrate uh, alternative coins into uh, their current structure. Senator, I I'm wondering, you mentioned the SEC and the CFTC, and there seems to be somewhat of a turf war going on between the two of them, and I'm wondering how that is influencing the way you're thinking about the legislation and um, how this actually plays out in real time when you have the SEC, in order to say something's a security, pretty much all they have to do is say it's a security and then you know they have to support that position when it, when it comes time to go to court. But I'm wondering how that's influencing your thinking about legislation and, and how you're thinking about the evolution of regulation in this area. Yeah, and that's a very fair question. Um, the Howey test was created by the courts uh, to help determine the difference between uh, a security and a commodity. Um, we take the 200 cases at the circuit court level that have been uh, used to further define the Howey test. We've uh, read them all uh, and seen the consistency uh, in how the Howey test has uh, been further refined over time and then take the uh, cumulative uh, work of those circuit courts and put it into uh, the law. So uh, no longer will the SEC uh, be making a, a judgment call about uh, whether something's a security. The law will. And if something is unclear, then uh, a legal challenge can be made using the Howey test and existing uh, circuit court uh, decisions uh, to help iron those uh, uh, and, and resolve those those types of questions. So, so are you saying that you're going to legislate what the, how, I mean, I guess it won't be called the Howey test anymore. You're going to legislate what a security is and how you read it within the laundry list of the Securities Exchange Act? Um, it will be using the existing Howey test that is a court-created um, definition, putting that definition into law and then um, it will be more clear, we hope, uh, 
about those kinds of determinations, then it will still be up to the SEC to say, this fits the Howey test, this is a security. And then it would be up to the uh, challenge uh, of the digital asset that believes that SEC has got it wrong uh, to prove in court that uh, the SEC has got it wrong. Then we know that in the future there are going to be um, assets created that don't fit neatly uh, into any category and there are things that we can't even conceive of right now. So we've created a, uh, a body uh, that consists of uh, members of both the CFTC and the SEC uh, to address those types of assets that uh, just don't fit neatly into the Howey test uh, to help advise on how to regulate them and how to define them. I think that's a really exciting uh, thing to hear about just because I think that has been really where the pressure points have been. We're not really prepared to talk about these financial instruments within our existing system and it's causing everyone a lot of grief. So I'm glad to hear that that is something that um, that you're working to develop a, a, a way to address. Um, I wanted to kind of backpedal a little bit and hear your take. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the media about where are we on cryptocurrency and blockchain? What is the state of the digital assets industry? A lot of people say, oh, well, this winter proves that it's dead and gone. We don't have to worry about it anymore. I disagree with that. And I, I would assume that you would too. Um, where do you think we are in the development of digital assets as an industry? Well, I do believe that uh, the fallout from FTX's failure and other failures uh, have had a chilling effect, uh, but it's temporary. Uh, this is going to thaw. Um, among the things we've also seen over this past weekend is the failure of banks uh, because there were so many uninsured deposits. Uh, that's one of the strengths of Bitcoin. Uh, if you have your own wallet, uh, and put it uh, Bitcoin in, in the wallet. Uh, you don't need insurance because the wallet itself uh, is safe and you're not subject to the requirements of custodying your asset with a trusted third party because Bitcoin is a trustless asset. Um, so I think that's part of the reason that you're seeing a flight to Bitcoin in the last few days and its price going up. Uh, now, perhaps that's temporary. Uh, as we know, uh, the price of Bitcoin fluctuates, uh, so it's not as stable as a fiat currency. Uh, but for people who have a long-term view uh, of their asset, uh, Bitcoin is proving itself uh, an alternative to an uninsured asset uh, at a traditional bank uh, that may be subject to uh, the failures of traditional banks. Uh, in the case of SVB, uh, that bank uh, had an extraordinary amount of assets that were uh, over $250,000, the maximum amount that is insured by the uh, FDIC. Uh, SVB had about 6% of its assets uh, under the $250,000 threshold. Uh, in the typical banks in my state, that threshold is uh, over 60%. The same is true in South Carolina uh, and states that uh, have uh, less dependence on uh, venture capital uh, as its source of deposits. So the SVB uh, case uh, sort of proves uh, the need for uh, assets that can be stored in a trustless uh, manner uh, that is n not uh, requiring insurance, and that is Bitcoin. And do you see do you see Bitcoin as competition for the dollar, or you see it more like a gold 
you know, if you want to have an asset and store it away, you put it in Bitcoin. Um, and, and, you know, in that context, I'm thinking about CBDCs, the movement towards central bank digital currencies and how that would impact Bitcoin. Because it's clear. I mean, the la I think you, you pointed out something that's amazing. The, the rally in Bitcoin, as an investor, I'm watching this, the rally in Bitcoin over the course of the life of this this regional bank crisis has been has been outstanding and really may reflect what, a lot of what you're saying. But I'm wondering how that fits in with the the, the discussions about a CBDC. Uh, Bitcoin is far more versatile than a, a CDBC. Uh, I oppose having a CDBC uh, in U.S. dollars that is direct to retail. I think that's the role for stable coins. Uh, the, what we're seeing with uh, central bank digital yuan uh, is that it's used as a means of surveillance uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so the issuer of a CBDC uh, would have an extraordinary uh, access to information about the user of a CDBC if it's direct to retail. Uh, so I'm very much a proponent of a um, central bank digital currency that exists within the banking system, uh, the central banks and, uh, uh, and the, the direct-to-customer banks. But on, on the retail side of the paywall, that where the customer is, uh, it should be a stable coin that functions uh, in that role. Uh, in the United States. So that's the structure uh, that I'm advocating for. The um, uh, legislation that uh, Senator Gillibrand and I have uh, includes uh, stablecoin uh, in its approach. Uh, stablecoins in our bill have to be 100% hard asset backed um, in the case, so it's not a fractional reserve like the banks that we saw uh, fail over the weekend, such as um, SVB um, and uh, Signature Bank, um, it would have to be 100% hard asset backed for a stable coin to be issued direct to retail customers. Um, so that's sort of the structure that we hope will um, prevent uh, some of the uh, failures that we've seen in the last few days, uh, both in uh, digital assets and in traditional banking. Now, the um, stablecoin would probably have uh, a regulatory uh, connection to the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, which is at the Treasury Department. So it brings in yet another federal regulator, but we think this is a better way, once again, to mimic the existing financial system and lay digital assets on top of our existing financial system. Yeah, Senator, Kelly, if you don't mind, I want to just ask one follow-up question to that, because you said something so interesting. You said stable coins linked to a hard asset. You didn't say linked to dollars, which I find very interesting. And you also talked about this concept of the fractional reserve system and how that's obviously created problems that we're seeing uh, in the past few days. Our entire system is based on fractional reserves. The whole fiat money system, is is that something that you're thinking about? Like the entire fractional reserve system, the entire monetary system? Because when I when I explain to people, I, I am privileged to, to be a professor at NYU Law School, and when I explain to my students about how the fractional reserve system works, they get scared. You know, when you realize how money is actually made. It's all a bunch of debt that's sort of mushed together, um, you know, to, to define it in one sentence. And I'm just wondering, is that something you're thinking about more broadly in the context of, is that part of your motivation for, for enjoying cryptocurrency and looking at black, blockchain and Bitcoin? Is this notion of the problems in the fractional reserve system and the fiat money system in, in, in total? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. if, if you look at the um, language that accompanied the very first block uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, it referenced uh, the 2008 uh, financial uh, failures of some of the major banks in the world. Uh, and so clearly um, Satoshi uh, was thinking about exactly that. 
uh, when that first block of uh, Bitcoin was issued. Um, and uh, I too think of Bitcoin uh, as digital gold, as a store of value, uh, as something can, that can uh, alleviate uh, some of the personal concern that someone might have about our highly leveraged uh, system uh, that exists, as you point out, in the issuance of fiat currency uh, and that is used throughout banking uh, as well as within uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, the printing of money. Senator, we're coming to the end of our time, but I just wanted to ask one uh, more lighthearted question. What is the use case for digital assets that most excites you? Well, there's a, a company called Strike uh, that uh, was created um, after the Lightning Network uh, lay on top of uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and the, the Lightning Network lays on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, the Lightning Network uh, is the part of that blockchain that uh, allows for it to be used as a means of exchange. So uh, for the first years of Bitcoin, uh, it made more sense as a store of value. You buy and you hold, hence the term hodler, you know, hold on for dear life. Uh, but when the Lightning Network was created, uh, it allowed for the development of the, its use as a uh, means of exchange. And so now certain companies are uh, beginning to test and utilize that technology. For example, um, certain companies, including um, I think Walgreens and Whole Foods uh, are beginning to use the Lightning Network uh, so they can uh, get reimbursed uh, faster and more cheaply. So if you think about a um, credit card, uh, let's say I go into Whole Foods, pay for my uh, groceries with a credit card, but behind that credit card machine, it's converting from uh, fiat currency to Bitcoin transmitting to Whole Foods, they immediately can convert it back uh, to cash and they get their reimbursement faster and, and far less expensively. So I, I think that those kind of technologies are going to make uh, the more retail consumer case for using Bitcoin uh, explode. That's exciting. That is exciting. <laughs> Senator, thank you so much for being with us today. I, I learned a lot. I, I actually, until this moment, didn't know what HODL stood for. I just thought it was a <laughs> funny way to say hold. So I appreciate that very much. And uh, you are always welcome back. You, we have an open door policy to use, certainly. Kelly, it's always a pleasure being with you and, and, and doing the show together. And I hope that the audience has learned a lot today. And Senator, thank you so much for all the good work you're doing for the industry and for the country. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. And we'll see you next time here on Blockchain Explained. Kelly, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're going to take some time to circle back and talk a little bit about, about our conversation with Senator Lummis, because there were some things that came out of there that I thought were extremely exciting and incredibly important for the industry to understand blockchain. Um, you know, one of the things she said that is of particular interest to me, because I'm a monetary policy, you know, wonk sort of on these things, is her vision of Bitcoin and, and her idea that Bitcoin's movement and the, the price going up in reaction to what was going on in the, in the regional banking sector was incredibly interesting to me. The idea that she recognizes this idea that you can have money in a trustless environment in your own wallet that you can carry around with you. To hear that from a senator was quite striking for me. I, I don't know what, what you took away from it, but that's, you know, when we decided to come back and revisit her, uh, her visit with us, uh, that was something that I wanted to focus on. What, what did you think was really interesting about that conversation? I just like that a lot of the way that she talked about um, her approach to cryptocurrency, uh, the bill that she's bringing up, a lot of the things that you can tell she spent time thinking about how to target those are the same things you hear people concerned about. You know, um, she talked about stable coins 
And people are very worried about, okay, well, we've already seen one stablecoin collapse. Well, it collapsed because it wasn't actually backed by any fiat. And she talked about, you know, their, the need to have them be 100% hard asset backed. Like, she's, she is solving the problems people are bringing up with this system. She's working on the things people are worried about. And so I thought that was really encouraging to hear that the legislation that she's fielding, along with Senator Gillibrand, it, it seems like the kind of legislation that I would have liked someone to do, which is, that's what you want to say about Congress, right? Yeah, you know, and, and you and I have spoken with, to, to other members um, about stable coins, and that does seem to be a focus of Congress. It seems to be a, a safe policy place to be, um, mm -hmm. to, to re have requirements for stable coins, to figure out how they're used. You know, there's so many headlines with FTX and that, that are distractions from some of the, the good evolutions to have a stable coin that is backed by by some hard asset where money can move in an easier way. That that was somewhat of the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto um, minus the the asset backed for the Bitcoin. But mm -hmm. I, I find it really interesting how seriously she's taking the idea of cryptocurrency and these alternate assets. You know, people who dismiss um, cryptocurrency as a fad um, go talk to Senator Lummis and, and you'll have a very different impression. And I think, you know, to your point about how seriously she takes this, like she talked about the role that she's taking in founding uh, or co-founding the Financial Innovation Caucus. Having a champion like Senator Lummis, um, who is committed to this technology, committed to learning about it, that's what, that's what technology of any kind needs on the Hill to get not just legislation done, but smart legislation. And so, you know, I may not always agree with what she's gonna end up doing. I'm sure, you know, I never agree with anybody, <laughs> but but I, I take it, I, I think it's really encouraging that she is um, very clearly listening to a lot of smart people when she's learning about this stuff and she's doing great work on this. I, I think also um, one of the, coolest things that I learned from her, I had not heard about this before, was she talked about the Lightning Network um, and how that is going to help us build in more B2B payments, speeding up the economy in a way where we don't even realize as consumers that cryptocurrency is involved. Um, that's really cool. And that's not something that I knew about before um, her interview. I probably should have known about it, but it's just, you know, there's so much to keep up with in this industry. And that's just a really neat solution. Yeah, and the, the fact that she's so involved in the technology to understand the policy, because you know, one of the things that I've found in teaching, and, and I, I teach a class on financial instruments in the capital markets, and when I teach that class, I do it so you can understand the regulatory policy, so you can understand the legislation, so you can understand the law. And if you don't understand the technology, you can't make policy. And she really is making an effort to do it. One of the reasons we're, we've been doing this podcast is so people can understand, so blockchain can be explained, so people can make good policy decisions, can make good uh, business decisions. And it's it's great to see from somebody who's taking a leadership role in this area, um, the desire and the hunger to really understand what this technology offers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm excited to see you know, what comes of her bill. I know she mentioned she was reintroducing it soon. Um, and I'm excited to hear from more guests we have coming down the pike who may have different perspectives, but are just as committed to this technology. Yeah, yeah, and I'll disagree with you, Kelly. You you, you often agree with me. So that's true. You agree with me, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's always great. And and it, you know, it's been a pleasure to have Sarah Nalumis. Um We're looking forward to future guests. And I'm glad that we took this time to really digest what she had said, because I think that that conversation was worth, was worth taking note of. Yeah. Well, thanks, Alan. And we'll see all of our audience at uh, the next one. Thanks for listening to another episode of Blockchain Explained. Please note, nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Want more clear-eyed analysis of this exciting technology? Search for Digital Assets Forum at the Wilson Center for research, event recordings, and more. Want to ask our hosts a question? Write to stip, S-T-I-P, at wilsoncenter.org with your thoughts. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Blockchain Explained.